today we are inaugurating our uh, Profiles in Leadership series. And this is a series in which we invite leaders from the community to come to Kahila and to uh, teach us about all kinds of things, um, to hear about their lives, their accomplishments, uh, and we are so delighted this morning to welcome our first speaker, uh, Mr. Lori Loke, who is um, and so generously come this morning to, to teach all of us. Um, some of you, I know, are aware of Mr. Loki and his many accomplishments, so let me just talk to you uh, just about a few of them. Uh, he's the founder of Business Wire, but he, I think, might be best known for his most generous philanthropy. Um, in 2008, he was named as one of uh, the 50 top American givers and has joined the Giving Pledge, which I don't know if we've heard about, a program that Bill and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett started in June of 2010 to encourage wealthy um, uh, people and philanthropists to give at least half of their fortunes to charity. He's a graduate of Stanford University right here in our backyard and where he studied journalism and moved into public relations and started his own business. So he's a passionate supporter of, of, of universities, of education, uh, academic research, which we might be able to, to hear a little bit about, a building that was just recently uh, uh, um, that, that he uh, funded and, and was named in his honor, um, and has pledged grants to a variety of wonderful places right here in our area, including Stanford, Santa Clara University, Mills School of Business, uh, Bellarmine, et cetera. Um, so, uh, and he also is involved in some wonderful institutions in Israel as well. Technion, the Leo Beck School, uh, Van Buren University, et cetera, the Weizmann Institute. So I want to welcome uh, Mr. Loke, and um, I think we'll learn a lot from him this morning. So if we can all give us some... Mr. Loki's wonderful qualities. The, uh, there's a soliloquy that gets kicked around on the internet of the nightclub entertainer. And she gets up on the stage and says, uh, in effect, you don't look Jewish, what's Jewish? And starts out with a great big nose and, it's, and goes on to the uh, various physical definitions, it gets into the attitude thing, and it's hilarious. And so one of my favorite uh, bylines right now is that when I see someone, uh, for example, who's British and, uh, and doesn't have much of an accent, oh, that came through. <laughs> You're on now. Yeah. Uh, I say, gee, you don't look British. And uh, take off of that old thing. Anyhow, one of the things that Lil Wayne asked me to uh, discuss was, well, What's it like to be Jewish uh, 70 and 80 years ago? And I'll be uh, in six weeks 84, which means I'm, I'll be in my 85th year, and it's great. <laughs> All the girls get away from me. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, but uh, I'll get rid of this someday. The interesting thing about being Jewish in Portland, Oregon, uh, 70 and 80 years ago, was that there really wasn't much discrimination. There was on the blacks, of course. That went on until after World War II. Uh, you had your ghetto of blacks, but you also had in Southwest Portland a, a, a sort of ghetto of Orthodox Jews. But uh, only 5,000 in, in a city at that time in the 1930s with 270,000 people now has uh, 700,000. The being Jewish meant maybe you got beat up uh, between the ages of 8 and 11. You got beat up uh, uh, once a year. But then uh, everyone weak enough to be taken on got beat up at least once a year. And the Jewish factor never entered into it. I was always intrigued when we moved into a new homeroom teacher in grammar school days, it'd be 1933 to 1941, the teachers invariably by the third day wanted to know who's Jewish. 
And so the hand went up. And uh, I did, I never really cared much about tithing, but my uh, mother, uh, by the way, the family is very reformed, uh, and every Sunday I went to reform school. The, uh, that's an old term, that the reform school back then meant uh, the juvenile detention at the building. Um, and uh, anyhow, um, between ages 8 and 11, yeah, there might have been a little discrimination, but I think if you went to a place like Chicago in those days, the Deep South, you would find, and even New York, you would have found uh, much uh, more vivid dis uh, discrimination than you did in a place like Portland, or for that matter, uh, all of that, Oregon or Washington, if you were in Seattle or Portland. But as soon as you get into a small town like Longview, Washington, uh, there might be one family who's Jewish, and yet you felt no discrimination. I never really had a feeling that I didn't want to be Jewish. If it came about, it might have been that eight to 11 year period when uh, you'd get into the uh, little struggles once in a while. They weren't always uh, physical fights, they could, they could be words. And you'd wonder, what's the bother about? But by the time, uh, we finished the, the uh, grammar school level of religious school and Sundays, moved into the high school section. It, it felt kind of good to be Jewish. Now, uh, don't, don't be bashful, but how many of you kind of felt like uh, Jewish is a passive thing, it's not a big deal in my life, but all of a sudden as you aged and became 10, 12, 13 years old, it became an important factor. Did any of you feel at any time that it wasn't a huge part of your life? No, I'm one of them in that period. Yeah, and the, over there in the blue, uh, what changed you? What made you change? Um, I just grew up and I, and I just, at first, like when I was there, I, like I just thought everyone could be friends, like despite ethnicity and like it, it's not, like being Jewish doesn't really matter. Like and and that much in my life, and then when I grew up, I could, like in middle school people like done like a lot more like Jewish offensive jokes, and that actually made me like. Notice like how being Jewish is good. Okay, and, and somehow it just made me feel. Does anyone else have a comment to make along this line? Yes. I feel like for me, I just when I started getting older, I started going to you know temple more, and it started learning more, and it became more a lot more interesting to me, and I really started enjoying being Jewish and like learning about it. And then it became a bigger part, especially when I Yeah, once uh, I got past the confirmation class, that's the, the age 13 or so, uh, and into the high school level, I began to realize what a wonderful history we had, and that we could be darn proud of, of the centuries of contributions that the Jewish people have made to the world. Uh, and we're also the oldest race or uh, uh, people in the world. We've outlived every single civilization and, and uh, through the ages. Uh, the um, thing that impressed me as I went into my teenage years was the very thing, the contributions uh, our ancestors have made, starting, of course, with things like the Ten Commandments, because they became the basis of world law. There, there is nowhere else in the world back then or for thousands of years did anything to rear its head like the Ten Commandments. 
it became a very important factor. Uh, it, it, it's it's uh, a basis of Christianity as well as Judaism. Uh, the Muslims have their own little book, but you'll find elements of Ten Commandments there also. Uh, there comes a time in life when you have to bite your tongue maybe and say, now do I want to admit I'm Jewish or not? And the first test came when I was about 18 and a half being drafted at World War II. And there comes a time in that uh, when they're signing you in and after you've taken the oath that they make up the dog tags. And on the dog tag is your, your army number, 3949-2925. Who are you to challenge me? <laughs> but uh, the dog tag, your name, your rank, and then there's a little initial, P, C, H, and X, if you don't have any religion. Now, I knew in the Army I was going to be with a bunch of roughnecks that you really get the bottom of society at the end of a war when you're drafted. And uh, they, they're, they're really a lot of dregs of society. Only a couple of us in the whole platoon of 100 people, uh, uh, 60 <coughs> people, uh, had any kind of a real education. And it didn't take long, maybe half a second for me to say H. And of course, the first time we line up at, the, at Camp Roberts down by Paso Robles, the, the top sergeant's going down looking at every tag. And he pulls mine up and looks at it and says, hey, Joe, hmm. And I don't know if he expected me to be different or not, uh, but uh, maybe he wanted to say you don't look Jewish. But it, it takes, uh, I didn't realize at the time, it takes a little bit of nerve back in those days to acknowledge you're Jewish. It sounds funny, it might sound oddball to you. I had another occasion, and that was uh, right uh, about one year out of Stanford. I started with United Press in Portland, but I had a job offer at the Longview Daily News you know, downriver from Portland. And in the interview, the interview went great, and the editor was the son of the owner of the paper, the publisher, and uh, uh, John asked all kinds of questions, and it did great. And then came the killer. Do you go to church? And right away I said no. And, uh, and I pulled the dramatic effect and waited for a second, and the guy's kind of, uh, rocking back and uh, like, this is real bad news. I said, I go to synagogue. <clears throat> when I got back to Portland, I told my folks, uh, I was living with them for, uh, during that year, I told them uh, there's no way I'm gonna get that job in that town. And two weeks later, John called and said, are you still interested? And I said, I sure am. He said, come on, how soon can you start? And that did it. At that time, there was, there was only one other declared family of the Jewish in this town of 17,000. And the, with my getting that job, it, it put the, it just iced the case that, my gosh, uh, stand up, if you're overseas and you're in a place where they don't like Americans, you damn well admit you're American and be proud of it. I could have started this out by saying, uh, uh, how many of you really would like to be something else other than American? Well, half of you would probably say, yeah, Israeli, I would. <laughs> but uh, there's something uh, about the nationality and religion that shapes your character. Now, whether or not you believe in God, I guess uh, we uh, all do, but whether you, uh, or not you believe deeply in God is just part of the, the uh, essay. The other part, the real part is, 
can you live by the precepts that we ourselves set up several thousand years ago? And the, the significant thing that I've come to feel is that indeed there is God and each of us has a little piece of it. And it, we need to be our, well, this is our one shot, living as human beings on earth. This is our shot. We don't really know what's out there afterwards. We like to think that it, it's a bed of roses. But really, this is the hand in the bush. And this is where you make it. Now, uh, it, when I got to Stanford, I found that I wasn't much of a student. I, was, I, I discovered the newspaper and put my time in on that, loved it, the heck with grades. And nevertheless, I ended up with one of the highest ranked uh, academic scores Stanford has ever had in the C plus category. <laughs> <laughs> Joanne hates me, do I say this? But, can you imagine what I could have accomplished in life if I got a B average or A average? I'm a failure. <laughs> the grades like labels, American citizen, Jewish, and so on, are just that. It's what you live up to be. You live up to be uh, live up to the precepts that set up set us up in being Jews, uh, great. It doesn't matter if you got a C plus or not. Again, this is your 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 big shot. You have eighty to a hundred years. Uh, I've, I've only got thirty three years and one month left to live, one hundred seventeen. But uh, the doctor told me month or two ago that I'd be lucky to get to 110. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you take bad news with good, and, but you make the most of it. Uh, there's no way at my age I'm going to curl up and go to sleep and retire and, and all of that stuff. I've literally built a second job for myself, and uh, that's making money in the, in the market conditions are great and I'm doing fine. It's a lot of fun. Uh, today I'll make a million dollars. Yesterday I lost half a million. Uh, but it's a, it's a great life and it's intensive and it keeps you alive. And, and it's that old feeling, hey, make this day count. You have a limited number of days and make them count because what you can accomplish is, uh, adds up to the memories that are left behind when you leave. Uh, at this point, uh, who wants to ask questions?